Good morning. This is number 12 of my series of lectures and I hope that you're in touch with them all. There is a list of them if you want to find them. But this one is about facial form. Now, I've been most interested in facial form ever since I was oh, an undergraduate and even before that. I can remember quite clearly at the age of, I think it was 15, deciding that I looked better with my mouth shut. And I'm sure that that is why my face did not grow any longer than it has already grown. Anyway, um, this took me to reading a lot of literature. And I remember very well the statement by Brodie in 1938. He did a big study of x-rays and he found that, um, he made in fact the statement that the most startling find was that you cannot move anything but the dental alveolus. You can't change the actual maxilla and mandible or their supporting structures at all. Now, I now don't believe that, but at the time, everybody believed it, and I still think most orthodontists believe it to this day, which is why they believe malocclusion is um, genetic and uh, is predetermined at birth. I don't nowadays accept that thought, but I did when I was a, a dutiful student, should I say. Now, um, there was another chap that had a huge influence on me, and that was Charles Bolton. Now, he wasn't actually a dentist at all, but he was also interested in facial form, and he collected a really large, several thousand American, white Americans. Um, he found that there was an ideal profile. I think that's what he was searching for. And certainly he said that a specific profile did look best. And he drew this out and he superimposed it on various faces. He found that it was difficult to superimpose on any other structure than the forehead. Now, as you would know, um, orthodontists tend to use the sphenoid bone for all their uh, superimpositions. And I was taught as a student that the sphenoid bone hardly moves. That's why you can superimpose all the x-rays on it. Well, because everybody superimposes all their x-rays on the sphenoid bone, um, they all believe it doesn't move, but that's not surprising if that's what they're superimposing it on. I did a lot of research with x-rays, and I found that the sphenoid bone actually moves quite a bit. You know, it's got two wings, an upper and lower wing, which run out to the cranial vault. And I actually think that the uh, wings flap up and down rather like a bird, so that the body of the sphenoid and even its angle will change quite a bit simply by moving within the skull. And I think that has also misled orthodontists to a huge extent. Uh, they really, you cannot superimpose x-rays on the sphenoid and expect to see um, the changes that have really taken place. Well, um, I, I continued with um, my various bits of research on this. And I found that using the frontal bone was very stable. I can have a very good idea of how the maxilla and the mandible, indeed the rest of the face, had moved. This gave me a much better idea of forward growth because when the face goes forward or backwards, the sphenoid bone tilts to quite a large extent, you know, I mean, several degrees, which makes um, any forecasts very difficult. 
Anyway, um, I continued to superimpose wall by photographs on the front of the building. And for a while I used um, Charles Bolton's little silhouettes, which he uh, um, used to demonstrate facial protrusion. But I found that this didn't enable me to measure the movement, so I created a gnathiometer. Basically, that measures the position of the gnathion, that's the point on the chin here, um, in relation to the frontal bone. And that gives me a very good idea of just how the, the face grows um, in a forward or backwards direction. X-rays really don't show that. I remember the work of uh, Joanne Battergell. She demonstrated that you can't really tell when faces are going forward or back by using x-rays, and I think that is one of the reasons why orthodontists to this day really don't realize how much they take the face back when they use appliances, particularly fixed appliances, always take the face back. And I think everybody agrees that looks less attractive. I'm going now to give you a demonstration of how I use the uh, gnathiometer, as I call it, um, to measure the actual growth of the face. And I'll come back to you after that. This is the gnathiometer. Um, you simply um, place it on top of the picture. You need to have a life-size picture of the patient. You, I've created an app so you can do that quite easily. And, but you do need to take the photograph with a scale on it somewhere so that you can do the life-size reproduction. You simply take the gnathiometer, you place it on nasion, you then line it up with the forehead, and you can then measure how far forward the growth has gone. Here you can see his chin is way back. And if I then move over to this one, I can do the same, superimpose it on the Ganathian in line with the forehead, and I can see that his chin has come forward ooh, over 10 millimetres. This, of course, makes a huge difference to the appearance of the face, and also, of course, provides room for the teeth. And I think it's a very handy gadget in that you can measure precisely how much forward growth you have, which you really cannot do with x-rays, certainly if they're superimposed on the sphenoid bone. Um, you can see the close-up of the gnathion if I showed it the gnathiometer, I should say. Um, here's the gnathion down here. Here is the nasion where you superimpose, and this is the forehead where, that you superimpose along the line of. Um, it gives you a very simple um, measuring tool, and you can uh, you apply it to a large number of um, patients in sequence. This is the boy I was demonstrating just now, and you can see that his chin came forward quite a long way, um, and he now looks very different. Um, but on the x-rays, you would not really have seen that. Um, but I can also show you um, this young girl here. You can see originally her face looked quite flat, her cheeks that is, and her chin if anything looked a little forward. In fact she was a mild class 3 malocclusion. In the middle you can see how we distort both the maxilla and mandible. This is what we call the ugly duckling stage, but at this point we have corrected the indicator line, that is the position of the incisors in relation to the maxilla or mandible. But of course when you've done that you often create a big space between them, and this closes subsequently when the patient learns to keep their mouth closed and corrects their tongue position. And again, this girl grew oh, over 10 millimetres, and you can see the change in the face that that makes. 
I think that completes my presentation. But I will say that the advantage of the anathiometer is it can give you a measurement in millimeters um, from taking normal facial photographs. I think that's the end of the recording. Thank you.